This is a quick run through of using Altium start to finish, going through the basic steps of what you need to create a project, uh, make a design, a basic design using online parts and parts from the local library, and then export it for fabrication. So we're going to go through the whole thing start to finish as a reference for people to use. We're not going to go into more of the, some of the more advanced features. We're also not going to, um, we're not going to, you know, cover every detail of things that go wrong. There's other videos for that. We're also not going to do the setup. So the setup is, is covered in another video and in a PDF, which I'll post. Uh, so we're going to skip most of that, just do a basic start to finish so that people can do their initial sort of getting comfortable with Altium. So to begin, the Altium Designer 21, every single year it seems to change, and there's enough that changes visually, and there's enough that changes functionally that I like to um, that I like to, to just uh, do it from scratch. Um, so first we need to create a project. I do have the R drive mapped on this computer, so I have uh, a drive mapped as R that is the EE data drive, and that is, again, something that Altium expects. So if you saw the initialization video, it's really important to have the R drive map to be connected to the network so you're able to get the license server. Um, and then everything should go smoothly once you have that. This computer, by the way, is uh, 1920 by 10 by 1200 resolution. So I'm doing that. I'm deliberately doing a lower resolution. My other computers are 4K, but students have trouble seeing them. Sometimes even if you have higher resolution, it's hard to play them back if you don't have a 4K screen to view them on. So. So this is being done with a slightly low resolution computer, just so hopefully things are still visible as I'm doing them. So we're going to create a new project. And again, the, a good verification that we have this thing set up correctly is that we see this two layer PCB project template WWEE. So that is proof. If we see that, that proves that Altium knows the R drive exists, is able to connect to it, and it's load and it has the proper preferences loaded to tell Altium this is where you should grab templates from. Um, so we're gonna go, um, we're gonna name this just 320 LED and that should be good. Um, Actually, let's do it in, in here. Okay. So I just made sure I know where this thing is saved. So that creates two different files. It creates a PCB and it creates a schematic. And if we double click on the schematic, it takes us to our to our sort of landing page here. Uh, the preferences like project title, sheet title, engineer, draftsman, date. Most of these can be changed if we go into, um, uh, there's always several. So let's check project options first. So parameters, right? This is most of it. So these parameters, draftsman's name will be John Lund. Engineer name also John Lund. Why are they different? Uh, in, in larger companies, the engineer will design the circuit, potentially the schematic. The draftsman will be responsible for actually placing that, you know, putting that in a proper formatted order. So sometimes the engineer will, or the draftsman will take a rough design from the engineer and make it a more polished design for the schematic. Um, global date, let's just say October. Uh, Global title, this will be LED test board. And revision number, this will be 0 0.0.1. Okay, and you see this updates it. The one thing it didn't update is the sheet title. So the sheet title can, so that, that that's because the sheet title is specific to this sheet and it's possible to have designs with multiple sheets so if you have a large circuit you're not going to want to throw all of your design onto one schematic and so the details that i just entered these are details that are universal for the entire project if we want to name the sheet we have to to you know that's specific to the sheet itself it's not global 
And I believe if we just go to properties here, it'll give us the sheet. So if we're just click on properties while we're in the main the main sheet here and go to parameters, I believe we can set the And I'm just gonna call it unified design. And that just uh that just is a stand in to say that the whole design is on this one sheet. Uh, if you had a more complicated circuit, you might, if you had, uh, if you had the power regulating circuitry on one sheet, you'd call that sheet power regulators. If you had the microcontroller on one sheet, you'd name that sheet MCU or something like that. You'd usually pick names that describe the types of stuff that are on those sheets. And then uh, as long as those sheets are all added to the project, all of the circuits that are on those sheets will be imported to the PCB. The one challenge is that, and in Altium, you can only do one PCB per project. So if you have a project that's multiple PCBs, they could have changed this, but but when I started using it, one PCB per project. So if you do have a project that requires multiple PCBs, which is quite common nowadays, you have multiple PCBs, flex connectors in between, have them folded over. If you look at a cell phone, it's usually like six circuit boards all folded onto each other. Uh, if that's the case, you have to create multiple projects, but they might have added a feature where you can do multiple boards, but. Um, for simplicity, one board per project, as many sheets as you want, the, or as many schematics as you want. The, the one caveat that we're not going to go over is how do you get signals off a sheet? So sheets, so having information on a sheet and having information reference things off of a sheet, it's just like in programming where you have sort of like local and global variables. Uh, you have to be very deliberate in how you name variables to make sure that those variable signal names will exist uh, when you're referen referencing them on another sheet. So it's something we go into in other videos, but not in this one. So we're going to do a circuit. It's going to be a basic uh, op amp circuit that is going to, um, uh, it's going to allow us to plug, if we, if we have a LED, a random LED we found in the lab, and we want to know what color it is, the circuit's going to allow us to plug that LED uh, into uh, two pins of the of the circuit board and it will drive a constant current through that LED. So it's going to be a basic current driver op amp circuit powered by a USB port and just you know it's got, it's got some functionality. I want to have something at least minimal functionality so it's a useful circuit um, but not not too complex. So um, to do that we're first going to need a USB connector. So while we're here on the sheet actually I just made edits to this thing so I'm going to save. It's really good in, with Altium to save often. A new feature of Altium is they have the option to do, um, Altium has the option to do revision control. Altium used to be very bad at that. They, I haven't tried out their new option for that, but I've seen it as a, as a project parameter. So you might wanna give that a try. Otherwise, if you're not doing revision control, it's good to often take your project folder. You know, Anytime you do a major change, you've done a day's worth of work on your PCB, on your design, um, take that folder and zip it up and make a copy of it. Altium kind of does that. The way it sort of saves backups is it kind of zips up the schematic and the board and tosses them in a temp folder, but it's not good to rely on that. It's really good to, at, at multiple stages, save your entire project as a backup um, because we've had students for their senior design where they'll lose a week's worth of work because they, it's usually because they make an error in Altium that corrupts their entire project and it's, you, they can't get back from it. So either do revision control or save often in multiple places. You don't want to have a computer crash ruin your senior project when you get to that either. So um, one thing to note in the new Altium, uh, the um, parts are sort of in the manufacturer part search. It's sort of linked through OctoPart as a way you can buy things. Uh, the, the button is hidden behind my screen, but there's a button at the bottom corner called panels. Right now, the um, manufacturer part search is, doesn't exist here. I'm not fully sure why. Uh, it could have been just a setting. So I'm going to click that manufacturer part search to make it go back here. First thing I'm going to look for is a USB connector. So I want a USB connector that's a horizontal connector. I want, so I want this board to be able to plug into USB, USB A port and uh, be sticking out from the computer and then we'll be able to sort of plug in the LED there. So I'm just going to search for USB, oops, USB A. Okay, so I found a weird issue. Uh, I ran into an issue when using the software. Um, I couldn't place any parts from the manufacturer part search. And so what I had to do to be able to find parts is I had to um, close the manufacturer part search and I had to go to tools, preferences, 
and then um, data management servers. And I had to go to clear cache. And somehow that fixed it. And then I reopened manufacturer's part search. And um, I, I looked online uh, and found a right angle uh, USB that I wanted, found the part number, searched for it. So now we can place that. Okay. Now you'll notice that I move this, the, the grid is very fine. We don't want that. We want to snap to these nice grid aligned spots here. So I'm going to hit the G key and you notice in the bottom left corner, that grid goes from 50, 100, 10, 50, 100. We want it at the course as possible. So we want, we want it at 100 mil. That snaps the pins to these actual grids here. There's times where we'd want 50 mil, especially if uh, somebody who made the part uh, you know, it had pins that were 50 mil space. They don't usually do that, but it does happen sometimes. So we're just going to place this. We're going to hit escape. And the way I got to this from the manufacturer's parts search, I right clicked and then I clicked place. You can also download this. If you download it, it will save the schematic and uh, components. So it'll save uh, both the, the um, symbolic representation of it for a schematic library and also the physical footprint of it uh, for the for the uh, hardware board side of things. And if you do that, if you download a part that you use, I suggest you at the very least download it. Uh, but it lets you take these parts and compile them into your own private library that you can keep offline. Right now, this stuff is all in the cloud. So so anyway, that's that's the process we go through to get that. Uh, we can click out of it and it'll make it go away. Again, anytime you lose this window, you can go back down to the panels button, which is obscured by my face, and then you can pull it back up. So, um, so, Ground, shield, shield, V bus. What we're going to do is we're going to specify a ground signal. So doing this, and I'm going to plop it on this pin. And the ground signal is symbolically it says ground, but really this is just a labeled net. So we've just labeled this net connected to pin six ground. And if we want to connect these other pins to ground too, we can just run a wire to them. So we can just click the wire button. and make wires between it. And so now hit, I hit escape to stop. So now uh, the software knows that this symbol that's labeled ground is a, is a net named ground and it is connected to these pins. So it knows that all three of these pins should be connected to the net named ground. Uh, and then there's VBus. So VBus we could, if we want to, we could drop another pin like a VCC and then now anywhere in our circuit, we could use VCC and ground and we would know it would be connected to the VBus and ground of the USB connection. Uh, but let's not do that. Let's actually wire the circuit up for now. So we're just gonna delete that. Oops, have the part selected, click delete. So we're gonna zoom out. I hold control and do the scroll wheel and I right click to, to right click to pan. And this is right now a little bit off to the side here. So I may, might want to give myself more space. We're kind of forced to work with this. Yeah, let's just move it away from the edge. I'm not sure how I want this design to be quite yet. So we have our USB connector and now we need an op amp. So let's go back to the manufacturer's part search and I'm going to look for LM358. I'm going to try to find a footprint that will work for the parts that we have. And the parts that we have, I believe, they are TSOP. No, that's not right. Uh, what, what footprint are they? Let me go back and check. Is this MSOP? Okay. Manufacturer's part search. So my odds of actually finding a a three peak brand, uh, you know, the exact brand um, uh, 
op amp is not likely the some of these like more obscure asian brands just don't exist in the parts library they're not sold domestically very much so we're just gonna have to find something equivalent that'll work so i searched for lm358 msop and you know this could be rochester is one of those brands same with rome that quite often just buys asian brands in bulk and then sort of resells them so these might actually work this one looks right let's check it out yeah that looks right so what, well, what we'll do is we'll click that and then we'll just check the data sheet oops that's weird Well, I don't want to waste any more time. We'll check the pin out a little bit later, but for now, we'll just place it. Oh, it's doing that again. Oh, because we don't actually have the part. Shoot. It's got to have this little green part next to it for it to actually exist. What about this one? Is that the same one? Yeah. So... It's going to be it's probably VSSOP, which is the. SOP. That looks right. This looks right. So I'm pretty sure this footprint's correct. So the body of the part is about three millimeters by three millimeters. We'll go back and recheck that later. But for now, let's place this one. So this physical package has two op amps on it. But right now, it's just placing one. And do we need both for this design? No, but I usually like to put them anyway. So I'm going to put them here anyway I'm going to drop them both you notice when I dropped one it says U question mark a and now the second one is U question mark b so when I place the second one here and now look now it's U question mark a again so what happened is when I have a component that has two parts on it so on one physical chip there's two op amps symbolically that's two different devices so when I place it I place one then I place the other if I want to place a third the software knows that to place a third, I need to go back to a different physical part. So if I place three of these op amps like this, just start clicking, it's going to drop two physical op amp packages. If I do four parts, it's going to also be two physical op amp packages. Five parts, it's going to be three physical op amp packages, and so on. So I definitely don't need three. Uh, I really only need one to do the design that we're trying to do. So, But I'll place them both just so we know. And you'll notice this second one doesn't have power pins. The power pins are used here. Some op amps, when you find them, they have part A and B, and they will have power pins on both, which is a little confusing because theoretically you could connect two different things. And I don't know what happens, but just don't do that. Right? You, you can't power two op amps on the same physical chip with two separate supplies. So at least not with this type of op amp. So, so we're not going to do that. What we will do, though, is power our op amp. So we're going to power our op amp before we get carried away with ground here. And, you know, I kind of want to label I don't want to wire this thing up here uh, it's gonna be a mess if I do so I am just gonna do a VCC label so I'm gonna click VCC place it here and I'm also gonna place it here okay now VCC this is connected to V bus so this is gonna be 5 volts so a lot of times what I like to do is I like to change the name of this from VCC to something like 5 V0 oops 5 V0 and then I also would change this one to 5B0. Okay. You got to change it both. Again, this is just a label. It's a fancy label because it's got a little shape to it. It's got a little port structure to it, but it's just a label. If we label this 5B0, anything else labeled 5B0, even if it's just a wire, it's going to be connected. Uh, okay. So uh, what else do we... So we're trying to build a current driver. So what does a current driver need? It needs a some sort of a... Uh, voltage divider 
or needs some sort of a reference voltage that it uses to match to, to provide a current draw, we'll, we'll create that using a voltage divider. So uh, one thing we could do is we could do the manufacturer's part search and look for a resistor component, but let's instead go to the components tab and find it with a local library. Okay, so the components tab, we see we have miscellaneous devices, miscellaneous connectors, and the WWEE schematic library. So the miscellaneous devices and connectors, these come from Altium. These are sort of Altium provided default local libraries. So these are saved on our computer, they're not online. But we can find the resistor we're looking for in this miscellaneous devices. So if we click that and we go down to, let's choke a little bit. So if we go down to res, I think it's res three. Nope. So I think my settings are a little messed up here. So it's probably the previous time I'd used this, I changed some settings and I should set it back. So this is the symbol. Okay, so this res three, you'll notice it has three different footprints. So in our case, we want 0603. So 0603 is our um, is our, our standard part size in, in the uh, uh, program here. So 0603 as a resistor. Uh, and then we'll just go place. So I'm gonna hit the I'm gonna hit the space bar to rotate. I'm going to go. Place two of them. And we're going to eventually need a resistor for the current drain, too, here. Hit escape to stop placing resistors. Now, one thing you'll notice is these are all labeled 1K. With resistors, what we're saying here is this is a 0603 surface mount resistor. The value. Uh, doesn't change the actual physical structure of the part or the pads. So the value we type here, typing in a different value for this resistance doesn't change anything physically about our circuit. It just gives us a different label to say, we have to place a resistor of this value here. So let's do like we did in lab and do a voltage divider of one volt. So with a five volt source, a one volt voltage divider would require a 4K and a 1K. Let's make it a little bigger so we're not wasting too much power. Let's make it a 40K and a 10K. So I'll make the top one 40K and the bottom one 10K. And again, this is just, all we're doing is changing this as a note for ourselves. So we're just changing this to tell ourselves, hey, when you place this, this resistor has to be a 10K, this one has to be a 40K. Let's make it a true divider and put a ground on one side. And then I could, I could put a power port on the other side, the VCC, but using the VCC by default, it's not gonna help us. We're gonna have to change the name. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this that we renamed. So to do that, oops, to do that, I hit shift and then click it. And that made a copy of it. So holding down shift and clicking it made a copy of it. Uh, if I just click it and pull it, it moves it. If I hold control and click it, then it drags a wire with it so it doesn't break the wire. That's an important part. A lot of students are used to using circuit software where if you move a part, it connects the wire. And that's not the case in Altium unless you hold down control while you're doing it. So we've got our, our voltage divider here. One thing I noticed though about this op amp is uh, it's, uh, it's got the positive on the top and the negative on the bottom, which is not normally the way we design these. So I'm wondering if there's a better way that I can represent this. Can I flip it? Um, let's try. So let's take this part and we can do edit move. Flip selected sheet symbols along. I think it's a long lot. Didn't work. Edit move. Try that. 
Okay. So that mirrored it. So now I'll just rotate it around and there we go. Okay. All right. So we found a workaround. It's not a great workaround, but we found a workaround. Uh, one thing to be careful of now is uh, pin eight now still needs to be power. So the power still got to be here. And by convention, we don't like to put these ports upside down. So unfortunately, flipping it so that it made the angle right. This is a bad op amp part. Normally, op amp parts would have these lab the power pins labeled because um, it could be confusing here if you didn't know what you were doing. Okay, so now um, now is a more traditional circuit. So let's take should we use a one k. How much current do we want to have flowing through this LED? One milliamp is probably fine. If we're just trying to test what color it is, one milliamp is probably fine. So. So 1K resistor, just leaving it at that. 1K, 1 volt, 1 milliamp. So we have to ground the other side of this resistor. Our divider, I'm going to take this and drag it. Okay, and now I'm going to draw a wire from here to here. Make an escape. What's left? Now we got to get feedback. Uh, you know, though, that whatever we put in the feedback here, whatever we put in this feedback loop is going to get current driven through it. So what we'd like to do is have a through hole footprint for an LED so that we don't actually want to solder an LED in here. We want to just be able to place one in and push it up against the edges and have it work. So let's see what parts we can find to do that. So let's do a three millimeter. There's two main sizes of through hole LEDs, three millimeter and five millimeter. Um, the ones you're probably the big ones are you know the, i'd say the most common ones are five millimeter although three millimeter is becoming more popular now you know what let's just do five millimeter and then I'll, I'll show you a trick that we can actually do both so oh so if just it doesn't really matter we're just getting a sort of generic two pin Make sure it's a yeah, LED five millimeter worth red. Yeah, that's fine. Let's see if we get extra parts if we do this. Oh, look at that. We get a little some extra details here. That looks pretty good. So I can. Okay, perfect. So that this will show the cathode and everything. That'll be nice. So, so let's take let's take this part. Watch right here. Boom. Place. Hit escape. Go back to wiring. Okay. Uh, so now, you know, this one again, it's not doing anything. The software might not like that this is here. So. Uh, just that it's not being used. So one thing we can do is we can put these uh, don't cares or DR no DRCs. Uh, and these basically are symbols that we put on pins that we're not using to tell the software we know we're not using it. We mean to not use it. Don't complain that we're not using it. So that's always a good practice. We can also put them here. Um, or sorry, no ERCs, no electrical rule checks. And it just says we're not using it. That's probably not the proper way to terminate the, I think you're supposed to connect the differential pins together or connect them uh, through resistor to ground. I'm not, I can't quite remember off the top of my head what we're supposed to do with those, but there is a something you're supposed to do on the USB standard if you're, if you're only using the power from a USB connection, but. Um, okay, does that look good? Is our circuit done? Yeah, I think our circuit's done, so. Five volts comes from the V bus, and we got ground from the USB. Powers the op amp, powers the voltage divider. Has a fixed one milliamp current here. Okay, I think that's good. And our second op amp. Okay, now before we migrate this over to the board, we have to give all of these parts numbers. So we have to go through. So these right now have question marks. We could manually enter numbers here, but there's a cool way the software just lets us do it automatically. We can go annotation, annotate schematics. And what that's going to do is it's going to pop up this window that tells us here's all the stuff 
here's all the stuff that wasn't numbered. Um, and, and then it says you can do update changes and it'll suggest, okay, I'll call this J1 LED1 R1. And the order that it numbers these is based on what you specify here. So you can specify the way that it raster scans through the schematic and finds an unlabeled part and gives it a new number. In this case, we just did the same order that you read a book. We can accept changes, execute changes, and then close. Uh, we could have also done this just quietly. So if we if we just wanted to use the default settings, we could have done this quietly. So if I do Control Z and undo all this, okay. If I go back and I do go Tools Annotation Annotate Schematics Quietly, oh, it does the same thing it did before, but just without taking us through those multiple menus. And so if we're not if we're not trying to be deliberate, if we're just trying to give it a number to just get it out of our hair and go over to the board design, we can just do it this way. All right. Now everything looks good to me. But it's always good when your schematic is done, first of all, to save, which I guess they call it validate now, I guess. That's weird. See, every, every year they change it, not me. Compile successful, no errors found. Okay. If it had found errors, it would have probably popped something up here. So let's actually see if we do this. If we get rid of that, we do project validate. I guess it's okay with it no matter what. All right. I guess it doesn't care that we had a floating pin. Whatever. Okay. Um, so everything looks good here. So we're going to migrate all of these symbols that are represented, you know, uh, in an abstract form and a nice, easy to process symbolic form. We're now going to make the, all the connections we specified here in the schematic. We're now going to migrate over to the board. So, the, so when we migrate over to the board, it's going to place the physical components not the symbolic components, physical components. And it's going to know from how we labeled things and how we connected things with wires, which things have, which pins have to be connected to which in the board design. So first thing we do is we do uh, design update PCB document. And again, it goes, it tells us all the stuff it's going to do. It's going to add everything. Um, so we're going to go execute changes. So now all those parts that we created before, it just threw them all onto this, onto this board here. So we have the USB, we have the LED, we have the op amp and these three resistors. And they're all, they all have this, this silk screen numbering, which is kind of nice, but I found it's kind of a little big sometimes. So um, first of all, uh, our grid. So we, we want to keep things kind of coarse. So I, sometimes I like it when I have my parts, I just take them all and just get them on the board. The black, the dark black here is the actual physical board. Sometimes, and I'll take this and I will go and I'll hit space bar and rotate it. And this USB port is meant to stick off the edge of the PCB. And it has a nice little line here that labels where the edge of the PCB is. So we can move that to the edge of it. But you see, as I move it, it's real smooth moving. And that means that I'm not snapping to a grid right now. So what I can do is I can hit the G key and it'll pop up a little menu that says, how coarse do you want this? So I'm going to set it to 25 mil and then see if, yeah, now we got a little bit of a snap as we do this, but it doesn't let us actually get right on that board edge. So I'm going to hold control scroll wheel to zoom in. Yeah, it doesn't let us get very close to that edge. So I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna hit G again, set it to maybe 10 mil. That looks better. So now we have that PCB edge on the actual edge of the board space. And we can redefine the board space later, but for now we're just gonna do that. Um, we can look at these components in 3D too. If we hit the three key, the three key takes us to the 3D view, which lets us, so I hold control and right shift click it lets us see these yeah that looks pretty good look at that we got nice physical connectors through the board service map connectors for the data all of our components look pretty good we have our led that looks great so so i'm going to go back to hit two go back to the two-dimensional view so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to physically place these where i want them again it's a little too smooth so i'm going to hit g and set my grid to something kind of coarse like 50 mil we're not trying to save a bunch of space here so for now let's just place it wherever we want uh, and 
you can see these air wires, these little wires on the screen. Those tell us what pads have to be connected to what. They actually show the closest connection to a pad of the same signal in our design. So it kind of lets us see how things have to be rotated to prevent signals from crossing. So for instance, if I put this resistor here, that's fine. But as it's set up to be wired right now, it's the wires are going like that. Now you might say it's a resistor, so it doesn't matter which end goes to which. That's true. The software doesn't know that though. The software considers one side of the resistor to be different than the other. And so you, there, you can enable something called pin swapping, which lets you specify that that you don't care which 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 way the current goes through. You don't care which pin connects to which. They can swap those two pins with ease. Uh, but we're not going to do that beyond this video. So I'm going to take it. It looks like, though, it wants me to, to connect them crisscross. So I'm going to click it and hit spacebar and rotate it so those wires aren't crossed. And I'll put that here-ish or so. Don't worry too much about the name, right? The name is crossing over the pads here, but we don't care too much right now. Let's take R2, see... Uh, that thing is wired and okay so that could probably be like that so yeah you yeah, know actually i might want to rotate these i'm going to take this and go like that i'm going to take this and go like that okay that looks pretty good um okay and then um let's do our other resistor i don't know no real great options here usually we like to have resistors all in the same direction so maybe maybe just like that i guess Keep it a little far away from here. I think this will be fine if we do it like that. Oops. Um, you know, I kind of want to make this a little more compact. Let me just pop up here. The Windows key. All right, let's 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 make this a little more compact. So I'm going to rotate this, get it a little closer. I just want to stay within the width of the USB, basically. So, you know, let's rotate the whole thing. Let's do that and let's do that and let's let's do that yeah nice and compact now and now we'll put our led here so our led maybe like that -ish. okay Okay, now let's, let's hit three, see how it looks in 3D. That looks okay. Now, the biggest question I have when I look at something in 3D is, am I going to be able to solder this? Do I have enough space to get in here to these pins? Yeah, I might want to space that out a little bit more, actually. So I might want to take all of these and move it over this way and move this one. Hey, oops. Uh, Control-Z. Control-Z does work. It's your friend. Yeah, okay, that's probably, that's a little bit better, a little more spaced out. And I kind of want to move these annotations, these names. So I'm going to move the R3 down here. This is for you as you're assembling it. It lets you know sort of, okay, which, which one am I putting where? Okay, that looks good. Uh, J1 though, yeah. I think we know what this thing is. I'll put this, it'll be covered up when it's... covered up when it's actually placed there okay so now we need to wire this thing it's kind of it looks good it looks about like what we want let's wire it up so we can see just sort of a broad overview some stuff is really easy right this pad to this pad there's not nothing crossing here this should be pretty easy to do so we're going to go first of all we're going to choose the layer we want to start wiring on all of these pads are red which means we're operating on the top layer of the board so we're going to hit top layer and then we're going to go to uh, interactively route connections. You can also hit the W key to do this. And you'll notice it kind of, it's it's snapping the grid. And so it's kind of 
a little rough here, but it's fine. If we if we mouse over the pad, it'll it'll snap to the pad too. So we're gonna click that. And um the default this is, uh, is feeling a little coarse. So while I'm doing this, I'm gonna hit G and it pops up that menu. I'm gonna set this to 10 mil just to give myself a little more breathing room here. So I don't I don't ever like to have wires sticking out of the corners of pads. Um, there's just kind of a general design practice I seem to prefer. And you'll notice in Altium as you're routing a wire, it it sort of as you click, it it increases the firmness of each of your connections along the way. So as you're routing this thing, um, it uh, you know it 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 gives you a little bit of play with the previous connections until you sort of click multiple times to finish the route and it will avoid things so if you're trying to route here to here it'll you know it'll it'll miss things as you're going around so uh, i don't want to route that yet because it looks like that might be a little trouble here so uh, this one so we're going to power the op amp At R1, so at R1, we're gonna snake this thing around here. I like to give it a lot of space. So I don't, I don't like to cut too close to corners because if the fab messes up, then you're gonna accidentally get a short or you might accidentally short solder or something like that. Okay, let's do ground. Now, usually for like a ground connection, we like to do a fatter wire than just a thin little tray. So as I wire this ground, I'm gonna click this and, and I'm gonna hit tab. That's going to pop up the menu for the uh, width. So a via is the, the, the size of the hole that you're punching through when you're punching from one side to the other. By rule with the fab, usually I think the hole size has to be at least, the hole size has to be at least, I think, 12 mil. And the ring size has to be, like the total ring diameter has to be, I think, 24 or something like that, I think. Uh, I, I got to go back and check, but... You can always check the fab you plan to use. You can always go to their site and see what their sort of minimum requirements are. So just for now, we're not doing a hole right now, but I'm going to set this to 12 mil. Um, or, you know, I know 13 mil works. I know 13 mil and 27 mil. Oops, hit tab again. And I'm going to change the wire width from, it's 10 mil right now. I'm going to change it to something kind of fat. So I'm going to change it to, 24 mil. When you take senior design, we'll talk more about sort of the uh, general rules for choosing width. Now you can also run the trace all the way across two pads of the same signal and it will know, to, you know, it'll connect them both. And we might not want to do this. Having a thick copper right to a pad, it can make it difficult to solder this by hand. So this might be a bad option. Sometimes we like to make it to neck it down to a, a thinner wire before we make the pad connection, but it's okay now. Uh, it wants us to ground. We grounded the shield for this op amp, so it wants us to ground these two. So there's a couple ways to do it, but I'll just run it sort of near the edge. It's, it's just okay. Oh, okay. So go back. Let's route the power. But we'll also do a fat connection for the power. See, now one thing you notice as I was doing this, if I did this, if I placed a, a wire here like that, this is such a fat wire that it, it leaves a little blob on the other side. And I don't like that. I can, oops, hit, double hit escape, click that. And so I want to delete that little thing that I just left there. This is okay. Anytime it shows the copper touching, that's okay. The software will say that's fine, even though it's not actually, the terminus of this is not on the middle of the pad. It is making a copper connection, so it's okay. So now we need to get to this uh, LED over here. And the problem is we kind of pinched ourselves out. There's no way, the way we routed this, there's no way to get to this pad, to these pads um, through the top layer. Well, we could, we could snake it through here, but it's kind of a mess. We could, we could probably make it happen, but it's kind of a mess. So instead what we're gonna do, since we're pinched off here, is we're gonna use the bottom layer. So I, so as we're routing this, I'm gonna, just start routing this connection. And that doesn't need to be that fat. We're only carrying one milliamp on this thing. So I'm gonna hit tab, change this back to 10 mil. Now let's do 12 mil. 
<clears throat> and then what I can do is I can punch onto the other side of the board by taking my wire here and then hitting the plus key. So it's the plus key on the actual number pad keypad. And that drops me down to the other layer. So by hitting the plus key, it drops me down to the other layer. But the, but the software says, if you want to get from the top layer to the bottom, you have to drill a hole that's coated with metal. So we have to choose where to place that. And usually you just keep it far away from stuff. So I'm going to place it here. And as soon as I click to place it, now the color changes to blue, which says we're on the bottom layer now. So now we're routing this, this on the bottom layer. I'm going to connect it here, hit escape. Now, why was I able to connect on the bottom layer? Because this is a through hole part. So the hole for this LED connects to both the top and bottom layer. So I can connect to here on either side. Let's do the same thing over here. So um, again, I can, I haven't clicked anything yet, but if I hit the plus key again, oh, now it's going to rotate me through here. Oops. So I'm just going to hit escape and just go back to top layer. I think there's another, there is a way to, to go back instead of hitting the plus key. If you're actively routing, hitting the plus key will just switch back and forth. But if you're don't have a, a signal clicked yet, it, it has a bit more of an issue here. Oh, it looks like I missed that ground here. Yeah, so, so let's do route this signal and let's go back to 12. And let's plop this. I really don't usually like through holes in the middle of a chip because it's possible to get solder bridges underneath. But if we do it all the way in the middle, it should be fine. So I'm going to hit plus, drop down to the other side. Okay, so now I might say, all right, this looks good. Everything's done. Everything's fine. Um, and everything looks great. And then what I'll do is I'll save. And I'll go tools, design rule check. So what this does is the software looks at what we did with our routing wires and what we specified with our schematic. And it says, does everything match? Do you have pins connected to pins? Do you have anything connected to the wrong pin? Anything sort of like that? So if we run the design rule check, So it pops up a bunch of errors. So unrouted net constraint, this is important. This means we had a connection that we didn't make. So we definitely want to pay attention to that. Silk to solder mask, we don't care about that. Silk to silk, we don't care about that. That's saying that for the fab, you don't want to have the solder mask gap. The solder mask is this layer of plastic over the surface that keeps solder from, from sticking to stuff it shouldn't stick to. And it's saying if that's too close to the silk screen, it's possible the silk screen won't show up right. It's possible it won't print correctly. And it's okay. If the silk screen doesn't print correctly or there's breaks in the silk screen text, we don't really care. So the silk screen can, errors we don't care about. This one we care about. So if we click on that, unrouted net. So yeah, so if we read that, it says we have this unrouted net. And you can see it here. After we did the check, it shows, oh yeah, you forgot to make this connection. Sure enough, we did. So let's go back, uh, top layer and now it also remembers that the last time we routed ground we used these fat wires but that's too fat it's coming out of the pad there so i'm just going to hit tab switch this to like 18 mil and that's good enough give it some space okay that's fine that's fine okay so now if we do design rule check Okay, now it's good. Now it's just these stupid silk screen errors and nobody cares about those. Okay. So it looks like our board, our design is done correctly. Let's hit three and look at it. Oh, it looks good. It's looking good. So a couple things, right? One thing is um, this board is too big. This is a really big board. There's a lot of fiberglass. So let's shrink this thing down. So to, to resize our board, we're going to hit the uh, one key and it takes us to this board definition page. And we're going to go design redefine board shape and now we want to be really careful with grid alignment because we do you know we don't want this board to be a wonky angle or anything so i'm going to set my grid to let's do 50 mil and we want to give space we don't we can't cut the edge of our board too close to these holes because if we do then the fab's going to mess up so let's do it about here and um let's put a little radius on it so if we if we do this right you can see that angle there if I hit the space bar, it changes whether the angle is an exterior or interior angle. And if I hit, um, oops, the 
shift spacebar, shift spacebar changes the type of corner. If I want a rounded corner, I can do that. And now the side, the radius right now is set to 101. I can change that with the comma and period keys. So if I hit comma, it makes it smaller. If I hit period, it makes it bigger. Let's set it to 100 million. You can see it down there. All the way down to the bottom, line 90, 90, horizontal start with arc. If I hit period key, it gets bigger. We get up, and if I hold it down, whoa, we get a big radius on there. The comma key, whoa, we get a smaller radius. So I'm just gonna put a little radius on there. That looks good. Uh, actually, there's something else I wanna do to this board. So let's, let's put it back here. I'll show you what I'm gonna do later. Okay. Okay, and then I get once it's it, it kind of finishes it kind of closes the edge here, so I can hit escape once I'm done. And now I've redefined my board shape, and I can do. Oops, I can hit the two key and go back, and so now it's here. And if I hit the three key and look at it in three D, yeah, it looks good. It looks much better than before. Hit the two key. So there's something else I want to do. So this is great if we want to put in a five millimeter LED, but what if we had a three millimeter LED we wanted to test? Well, this is going to be too wide to stick in a three millimeter LED. So one thing we could do is we could add a second footprint for a three millimeter LED that should work for our needs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the schematic and I'm going to add another LED in parallel to this. And we're never going to have both plugged in, but it gives us the option to plug in each. So manufacturer's part search. Three millimeter LED. And whatever. This one looks fine. Okay, so I'm just going to place this in parallel. Hit escape. Wire it up. escape we have to annotate this so i'm going to do design tools annotation annotate schematics quietly it calls it d1 now you notice this one was called an led this one is just called a diode so i prefer led as the prefix for leds but it was two different manufacturers had a, two different standards there is an ieee standards reference manual on the r drive that i believe it specifies led for labeling light emitting diodes and d just for other normal diodes uh, design update pcb document Oh, it doesn't like unmatched reference object. Well, we'll make sure everything's connected. Okay. Space and rotate. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to put this other footprint here. Why, why are these the same size? Uh, I guess the pitch is the same on five millimeter versus three millimeter. Huh. Learned something new already. I didn't know that was the case. All right, well, you know, let's wire it up. So we can, whatever, same thing. Who cares? We'll have actually, we'll have shotgun LEDs here. So we'll wire. it doesn't matter which layer we do this on right now. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, hit the three key. Everything look good. Hit the two key. Should I do a final design report? Okay, everything's looking good. So adjust the stupid silk screen. All right, so we're done, right? This is a beautiful board. This is a cool little thing that we can plug into uh, a USB port, and then we can shove an LED in here and, and push it off to the side, and it should show what color it is. Or if it's backwards, we got to flip it in the other direction. Um, how do we actually get this made? So we've designed this. We might have these components. They're in the locker. They're in the reel that's in the lab. How do we actually fabricate this? Well, we have to, we have to create files that a fabrication facility would use to produce this design. So to do that, let's hit the two key, go back to 2D mode. We're going to go file, fabrication outputs, Gerber files. So this is the sort of precision that we have so the so this sets our max resolution 2425 is either one's fine uh, we're going to specify the layers that we need so we need the top overlay that's the silk screen the top solder that's the solder mask layer the top layer that's the copper on the top the bottom layer that's the copper on the bottom the bottom solder uh and the bottom overlay and uh, and then 
here's these mechanical. So we forgot about one thing, which is the board outline. So I'm going to cancel this for now. So uh, we forgot about the board. Out. So the board outline is defined in Altium, tells Altium where the outline of the board is. The problem is this doesn't translate very well to uh, the fab can't see this unless we give the fab our Altium files, which some fabs are okay with now. So we need to actually draw this board outline using some other layer here. So we have mechanical seven, mechanical eight. So our goal is well, we just want to take any to do this. The trick to do this is take any unused mechanical layer. It looks like mechanical twelve isn't used. I don't see any puce. That's the color. And then uh, we can do tools um, convert. Um, Did this the wrong way, I think. Yeah, did this the wrong way. So we defined the board shape and now we're trying to export it. The better way to do it is to define the board shape with some layer like mechanical 12. Place a line. And we can we can just redo the board shape we had here. Oh, look at that radius. Yeah, let's do a slightly different radius just so it's clear. So let's make it a bigger radius actually. It's gonna be huge. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And hit escape. Now what we can do is we can define our board outline from this from this line here. And so how do we select everything that we just did here? Well, we did all this in on layer mechanical 12. So one thing I like to do is I select one and then I right click and I do find similar objects. And then I say, as long as the object is on mechanical 12, I don't care what type of object it is, as long as it's on mechanical 12, select it. So as, as long as the only thing that was on layer mechanical 12 was that shape we defined as the outline of our board, it's going to select it. So now it's selected all of that that we just drew. And then I can go and I can do design, board shape, define board shape from selected objects. All right, so now that just did that. And so now the board is shaped in Altium as defined by that layer. And also we now have this layer as something that we can export as something to the for the fab. So let's go back now to, so let's save all. Let's go back now to export, oops, fabrication outputs, Gerber files, two five layers, Top overlay, top solder, top layer. So you'd want the paste only if you were creating a stencil. The, pa the paste says where solder paste needs to go, but that's only relevant if we're doing a paste stencil, which we're not in this case. Bottom layer, bottom solder, bottom overlay, mechanical 12 is also one that we want. Okay. Okay. And then, yeah, don't want, we don't want anything added to all plots. That's actually, this is good. Okay. Now, what this did is this just created a whole bunch of files. It created a whole bunch of files and it let us see them all at once using this Camtastic. Camtastic is just software that, that Altium uses to display Gerber files. But, but behind the scenes, it just created a whole bunch of Gerber files. And those Gerber files are what the fab facility is gonna want to actually make our PCB. So, so we did that, Let's, but we have one more thing we have to do. We have to do the drill holes. So we specify, so every single layer here that's part of the physical PCB has been exported except for these holes here. Um, and so now let's do, ah, ah, I messed up. I wanna do one more thing. I wanna add my name to this. So I want to go to the top overlay layer. So top overlay. And I want to add my name. Replace string. Hit escape. And I select this string. 
and I can do j.lunt. So now this, this is going to show up on the silk screen on this board. And I also, just for fun, I want to add to the bottom. So I want to do bottom overlay, and I want to put a silk screen on the bottom. And one advantage of putting some sort of silk screen on the bottom is if you don't have anything on a layer of your design, then the fab sometimes gets upset and it says, you didn't tell me what was on here, or this is a blank file. So I'm just going to put something on the back there. Place, string. Now, you'll notice this is on the back side of the board. So if the string looks like that, it's going to be backwards. So if I hit tab, I can do mirror, and then I can do doctor one to be really arrogant, right? Doctor one, specify that. So put that on the back. Okay, hit escape. Okay, so now if I look at the 3D view, oh, look, we've got Jlund here. If I hold shift and rotate, yeah, and we got Dr. Lund on the back. Nice and arrogant. Now we gotta export all those Gerbers again. So we gotta do fabrication outputs. Gerber files. It should have saved everything we specified on the first time around. So all we should have to do is click OK and it'll overwrite all those old files. Um, okay, so we got to go back. We have one more thing. We got to export these drill, all the drill holes. We have a hole here, hole here, hole here, hole here, these holes here. So file fabrication outputs. We're going to want to go to NC drill files. Uh, so we want to keep this the same as the previous one. So the previous one was two to five ratio. We're going to keep that same app. We're going to keep that same format. Inches two to five. I like to keep leading and trailing zeros. It doesn't seem to really matter though. Um, we do want this though. So we have slots in this design. So if you look at this USB connector, these are not round holes. These are slotted cuts. So because we have slotted cuts, we're going to have to do um, drill. Uh, yeah, drilled slot commands here. Yeah, drill slot commands here. So we're going to have to do that. Now that's right, right? So it looks like the holes, oop, I don't know what happened here. The holes we have here are the holes in our, close to, in, in our design. We see those slots too. So that should be everything we need. We have top copper, top overlay, uh, top solder, bottom copper, bottom overlay, bottom solder, the board outline layer, which was somewhat of a random layer we picked, and the drills. And so now we got to find those and send them to the fab. So if we go into our folder, we had this project folder that we created. If we go into project outputs for this folder, we can see all these files that we just exported here. And the only thing we have to change is this GM12. So we use layer 12 to specify the outline of the board, but the fab doesn't know what that means. So we have to specify that this is the board outline, which is usually done as GKO. So I'm going to rename a GKO. It's going to say, are you sure? Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. So now I'm going to take all the files we need. So the bottom layer, the overlay, the bottom silk, the outline, top layer, top overlay, top silk. And then we're going to do the round holes and slot holes. And, so, and we're going to right click it and we're going to go. Uh, or we'll just do send to compressive folder. And I'm going to call this Lund, whatever. Okay. So again, in the zip folder, it's just our, our drill holes. Sometimes the drill holes will be merged into one file too. Uh, and then all of those layers that we have here. So, so nothing magical here, just, just those, those layers. And then now if we go to a fab site, we go to, I, so I'm going to use Oshpark. Oshpark is in the U.S. They're really great if you have a small number of, uh, if you have a small number, like small boards, and you want nice high quality boards sent back to you for not too much money. You don't have to pay $30 in shipping. They're a great source for that. So uh, it says browse for files, but you can just, uh, you know, once you got it, once you got your files you need, you can just go 
And then Osh Park is going to say, hey, we're going to make sure that these design files are all good. And it's taking its sweet time. Look at that. Okay, so we have Well, what's going on here? Whatever. Looks good. Looks good. So it has some things. Corrected drill, okay. Detected supported drilled slots, okay. It, it means it can do them. Correcting drill precision, okay. It says verify they align correctly. So and it merged the two drill files for us. Everything looks good. We see a little black dot in the middle of these things. Oh, I don't see slots though. I don't see slots. I'm a little worried now. Because these should be drilled slots, and they're not drilled slots. Hmm. Yeah, these are off a little bit. Okay, so that's a problem. So we're going to go back and we're going to go to the fabrication outputs, uh, NC drill files. Yeah, I think I, I shouldn't have set it to the drill slot command. I think that was it. That G8S, I think, was the mistake. So, all right. Let's see. Perfect. So now we have I think it was that G, G8S command. I don't know why I, I don't know why I specified that. So I think that was the issue. Okay, so sorry for that screw up there. But it's a good thing to, to know, right? You want to pay close attention to this, right? So this all looks good. I already had an account, so I think it I thought I was trying to steal from myself. Look at that. Five bucks. Five bucks shipped to our door. Done. All right. So that's the process. Start to finish. Sorry for the screw up. Uh, but, you know, working live, you get to see what happens. Um, and that's it. So, so the goal for you is going to be to do something similar to this. I will give you an assignment that's similar in complexity to this. The goal is just have you go through the steps, go through the steps of creating the project, doing some minimal design, both the board uh, and schematic, exporting it for fab and showing me that the fab design works. So show me that through Osh Park that you were actually able to successfully have your design show up um, in the output. So, so, and I'll give you the details on how to do that, but for now, see you next time.